So you found this uh, Moshe Eagle text, which mentions Proclus. That's cool. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a new thing. I'm not sure, but I think he wastes most of his time on some whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Um, um, so last time we did 125, 126. So today, let's see if we can do from 127 to 129. Okay. Okay. And we'll start it then with uh, 127. Um, do you want to, um, yeah, read the title? I'll comment and then you read the, the argument. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear um, you. Okay, no. Okay, 127. Yeah, says, all that is divine is primordially and supremely simple. And for this reason, completely self-sufficient. Right. So a couple of things. You might think, hasn't he already shown this? Right. He's already shown that every god is a self-complete Hanad. So doesn't that already show that it's primordially supremely simple? Well, it also shows that, and that's the basis of it, um, of his, um, of his uh, proof. But the being a Hanad also involves being a cause of unity for other things, right? Um, get granting, unifying other things. Um, and being simple and not having any parts is just, um, uh, just one aspect of that. So he's focusing on that. And also he's saying, this is why gods are self-sufficient. So, I mean, it's traditional to say that gods are self-sufficient because the gods are perfectly happy. And one of the things that you need to be happy is to be self-sufficient. Right? You can't depend on others. And, um, and he's saying the gods are self-sufficient because they're completely simple, because he also wants to avoid the idea that they're self-sufficient in the sense that they give themselves their own good. Right, because that would involve some kind of duality or multiplicity within them. And that was the argument in Proposition Nine about why the self-sufficient is not the good. It's uh, uh, because uh, the self-sufficient um, has its own good, gives itself its own good, but it isn't the good itself. And and so here he's saying, yeah, you can say that the gods are self-sufficient. They're the most self-sufficient things, but simply because they are simple without parts, and so they don't depend on anything outside of them, and they don't have any parts in themselves that they depend on. So I read this proposition as more like reinterpreting something in the tradition that might be uh, problematic, because that might imply that the gods are multiple in some way. So the tradition saying that gods are, are self-sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is the proof? Yeah. That it is simple is apparent from its unity. All deity is perfectly unitary. And that as such is simple in an, a special degree. So simplicity is, is part of unity. Um, that it is completely self-sufficient may be learned from the reflection that whereas the composite is dependent, right? If not upon things external to it, at least upon its own elements. And the perfectly simple and unitary being a manifestation of what unit of that unity, which is identical with the good, is wholly self-sufficient. Um, something that's composite has parts which it's dependent on at least like the parts must be before it somehow I don't know um, yeah that's uh, that's the idea in two in two ways either you know some composites are posterior to their parts and and then in that, that sense yeah so for instance um, this book if you uh, if you took out one of the propositions, it would be um, incomplete. Um, 
and I think the book is incomplete because there are propositions missing. Or, but there are also holes that are prior to their parts, right? That generate their parts. For instance, an organic hole, an organic body. Um, there, there is also a sense that there are some parts that if you took them out, the person dies, like their heart. Um, but um, you could say, well, no, but the you know, like the the form of human being doesn't deter, doesn't depend on this specific heart, and like it's it's in the soul that's forming the the organism. Um, but even then, okay, the soul needs a body to act upon and to unify. So there's this necessary reference to something outside oneself. Um, and in that sense, also not not self sufficient. You know, need needing an object to act upon. Okay, and then since the henads are manifestation of that unity which is identical with the good, is wholly self-sufficient. And perfect simplicity is the character of deity. Being a pure excellence, deity needs nothing extraneous. Being unitary, it's not dependent upon its own elements. Hmm. Not sure. Because it has, right? It's not, this is not dependent on, upon its own elements because it has no elements. And being a pure excellence, right? So, so that's how, you know, uh, Proclus would prefer to speak. He would prefer to say each God is a value, right? Is, is a goodness. And therefore, it's not even a question of it being self sufficient. Right, it's the value in terms of which other things are said to be sufficient or good, whatever. Um, but since this is, a, you know, this is a traditional epithet, he has to deal with it, and and so he's saying, well, the self-sufficiency just is it. it's it's being a value, being this simple goal, um, and that's the. Yeah, the, that's what he's doing. The being a manifestation is an interesting way because we've talked about how it's difficult to know exactly what the relationship between the henads and the unity itself is. So here he, I mean, Dodds has translated being a manifestation. And here he... Um, uh, uh, uses the word prostizamenon, which is like to put something in place of another, to stand in the, in the place of another. So like to represent, that's why uh, Dodds chose manifestation. So that's an interesting way that he's, he's chosen to express this relationship. Um, uh, yeah, so that's 127. Um, okay, no. Uh, okay, let's... <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, it's it's also it's 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 not that it's not that rich a, a proposition. So it's uh, it's not that difficult a proposition, I think. Um, um, let's now go to one twenty eight, one twenty nine. The the main purpose of one twenty eight is to help prove one twenty nine, I think. Um, but okay. uh, we'll do one twenty eight first, and we do one twenty nine. Okay. Every one twenty eight. Every God. Yeah. Every god, when participated by beings of an order relatively near to him, is participated by directly. Um, like which order? Like a noose? I don't know. And by those um, more remote, indirectly, through a varying number of intermediate principles. Right, so the um, the closest order um, he doesn't he'll he'll say this later is being, um, but um, yeah, the idea is that there are some orders that are that are closer to unity itself because they have greater causal power. So remember, like a being is be is above life is above noose, which is above soul, which is above body. Um, 
And he's saying, well, the very first things will participate directly in the in the um, in the gods, but the other things will then have to go through um, the intermediate principles. Um, okay. Okay. For the highest orders, having themselves the character of unity through their kinship to the divine. So that's what higher means, right? They're higher because they have more unity, right? Yeah, more unity, more power, more goodness. The three things go together. Okay, right. Okay. Uh, since they're higher, they can participate the divine henads without mediation. Whereas the rest, because of their declension and their extension into multiplicity, so they're less one, require, or less powerful, like you said, require the mediation of principles more unify themselves if they are to participate what is not a unified group, but a pure henad. So they could participate something called the unified group, maybe directly, but they would not be able to participate a pure henna directly. Right. Here, uh, the idea, when he contrasts it with the unified group, and he talks about it as a, um, their extension to multiplicity, so he's saying, like, things that are divided amongst each other, um, so, for instance, there are many human beings, right? How can there be, how can many human beings uh, uh, you know have a relationship to something that's simple um, or, or even not just the many human beings but a single human being who is just you know but he's he's a separate part of the group he's just a partial particular human well first he go he has to go through something which is a unified group which is like humanity as such right which is not uh, one of many, but um, uh, a unification of many things. Well, you might say humanity as such is still, you know, just one of the forms. So you have to go up to like noose, and well, that's how you uh, climb climb the uh, um, climb the hierarchy, right? So each level is more discrete um, than uh, than the uh, um, than the one above it, which is more unified, and eventually. You get to something that's simply a unified group, and then it's uh, connected to the uh, to a henad. Okay. Um. Between the henad and the discrete manifold lies the unified manifold, which, in virtue of its unification. Is, a, is capable of identifying itself with the Hanad, but in virtue of its implicit plurality, in some fashion akin also to the discrete manifold. Yeah, so... so this is like the intermediate thing. Yeah, we, we've seen the unified manifold connected with Hanad way back in Prop Proposition 6. Um, right, uh, which was every manifold is composed either of unified groups or of henads. Right, the idea that the very first plurality has to be the self-unifying group plurality that is only made of unifying things, that's only made of henads, of, of, of unities. Right, and and then other, um, so that has to be the first uh, multiplicity that that unites itself and then that connects the other multiplicities to um, uh, to the one to unity itself um, and that's the um, yeah and so he's he's basically repeating this but now he's talking about it with regard to the gods you know he's now in the meantime, he's shown that, that the gods are the henads, and and so um, that's like this application, this theological application of that proposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and since it's talking, I mean, we'll, we'll see 129, and when we read 129, it'll be clear why you can see 128 as a 
um, as kind of like a, a, a pr preparation for 129. But we can think of, you know, we've talked about that there are different ways in which the gods are present. And one of them is that things like the god is present in everything that shares its unique characteristic. Um, and so Helios is in the lion and in the rooster and in the palm tree. And so here, you know, he's saying, so Helios will be present to these separate things, but only first once it's been present to unified things. And it's through the unified things it's present to the separate things. So it could be talking about that kind of presence here in 128, but 129 is quite clearly about the body of the god, about the, all the immediate participants of the god. Um, and, and you'll see that in... Uh, in 129. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so if you don't have more questions about 128, we can move to 129. No, I, the question was about that, but let's do that first and then try to see. Okay. But 129 says all divine bodies are s divine bodies, meaning things like the sun or I don't know. Yeah, like the sun, um, the heavenly bodies, the whole world. Yeah. And, and in what sense are they called are they divine bodies ah that's what this is about okay so uh finish reading the title and then we'll... okay um, yes um so oops so are such to the mediation of a divin divinized soul so they can't be directly divine because a body is too far from the unity according to what we just did so they have to do it through a soul all divine souls through a divine intelligence and all divine intelligence by participation in divine henad the henad is immediate deity the intelligence most divine the soul divine the body dissimilar yeah it has um it has a, a divine uh, character similar to divine yeah it's um it, the question Proclus is inventing distinctions here <laughs> and so that's that's why the the word in greek is theoides so which has the form of of divinity but how that is distinct from divine you normally wouldn't think it's a distinct meaning right he's just saying okay this is this is less um so uh, the best that i can s explain is that it it has divinity as a as a character that it receives it's not some in something internal to it um the because the thing is so the word god in greek texts god or divine gets thrown a lot gets thrown around a lot and much much more of that in, in the monotheist text. And, and so there are bodies that are called divine. Like the world, there are things that are souls, um, uh, universal principles, new noise, um, and also personal gods like Zeus and Hera. And what Proclus is doing here is he's like kind of organizing what these terms mean in each context. And he's saying, well, you know, since there's this chain of mediation, the God, the, the, the God itself is only the individual head, the person. But these other things can also be called divine because of the chain of participation, but they're, each one is less divine than the last. And so he's, it's, um, that's what he's, um, he's basically doing here. Um, and that's the way that, so these got, um, these bodies, we asked, well, in what sense are these bodies divine? Well, it's because they're, um, they ha they're living bodies moved by a soul, not just living bodies, but living, always rational bodies um, that are, um, that have a noose of their own. And they're living, always rational bodies that exercise providence in some way, exercise providence in this sense of being the originators of some value or some good. And that's why there's also a hand um, that they immediately participate in. Um, 
Okay, and, and so the, so where yeah oh and where do when do things stop being gods? What things are not gods according to this? Or is everything so there's um uh there are noise that don't participate in in henas spirits diamonds right they have souls and bodies there are human beings and there are uh, and there are other animals human beings and other animals as a group and there's also individual plants and rocks and artifacts and things the holes of the world, the world as a whole, each of the heavenly spheres, even each of the elements taken as a whole, so like all of water and all of fire and so on, each of these things is a god for Proclus. And the whole um, of humanity also? Yeah, like... ultimately, yeah, the whole of humanity is... Um, so... I don't think the whole of humanity is in. I'm not sure. There might either be that the whole of humanity is the body of a god, namely Prometheus, or it might be that he just gives us unity. No, I think the whole of humanity also is a god, is Prometheus. Uh, yeah. Um, that's that's the case. We have all humanity has a common nature, the human nature, this human nature, um, the same way that a single human body has a has a vital nature, and the same way that the human body has a single nature that's um, that derives from its soul. Also, the um, humanity has a uh, the common human nature comes from. No, it's not going to be the same individual. No, it's not going to be the same individual because it's going to be like us and our daimon. We have a daimon, right? A, a spirit that talks to us like Socrates' daimon that kept him from uh, doing things at certain times. And also all of humanity has as its daimon, as a relation to um uh to Prometheus as as a Prometheus were the guardian diamond of, of humanity. I think that's the analogy. It's not like us and at least I think I have to think about this. It, mm. So either Prometheus is so Prometheus is the god of humanity. That means either that humanity is directly his body, so to speak or that he is responsible for the unity of it, but without directly constituting the body. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, um, but, so that's a good question, but in general, and I'm not sure because it doesn't mean, discuss this specifically, but the whole, um, but, but, the say so to speak cosmic holes like parts of the cosmos um heavenly spheres totalities of elements those are definitely divine mm -hmm. um it's it's only particular things taken out um that have some individuality or separation that's when you get to non-divine things um but yeah but because of that, also, then you, know, you can say that everything is full of the gods. Um, we'll we'll see that him quote this also in this text. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that would mean what? Well, in what I just explained, it means that you know, even if even the non-divine things, they are in some sense under the power of the gods and uh, controlled by them and within some larger totality that the totality itself is you know a direct participant in the gods
So a, a cup of water is not divine, but water as such, you know, the, all of water, thinking of this perpetual water cycle, the rivers that always flow into the sea and the rain and so on, um, that or that whole always moving body of water, of all the water for Prakos, that is a god. So yeah, that's the okay. And, and what makes it divine or a god is really participation in a god. Yeah. So, so God is said in many ways. Um, in the strictest sense, it's just the henad, but in a looser sense, you can say it's the henad and all its participants. So just the same way that, for instance, uh, um, a human being is said in many ways, because you can mean just the soul or you can mean the soul with the body. But the, in the strictest sense, it's just the just the head. Right, and this is allow it may it is possible, but mainly because of this um, uh, concept of participation. Right, which is like this. I don't know what it is exactly, but like this um, likeness of things to what they are caused by or what they are towards, something like that. Which is the same thing. Uh, yeah, is participation. Yeah, participation is some kind of of likeness or sharing in a property. Um, is um, and every every effect is part. He says in a loose way that every effect is participates in its cause. Um, is it something more than that? I mean, certainly at the beginning of the elements, it's different. But now he's he's brought the two concepts so close that it is a question. So it's certainly not okay. The the two concepts of being caused by and being part and participating in aren't the same because of his distinction between the participant, the participated, and the unparticipated. So the, you know, when, when we say that Socrates participates in wisdom, there's Socrates, Socrates wisdom, and wisdom itself. And the, he wants to say that Socrates wisdom is caused by wisdom itself. But he doesn't want to say that Socrates' wisdom participates in its um, in wisdom, because that would mean that there would be then Socrates' wisdom, Socrates' wisdom, wisdom, and wisdom itself, and you get into an infinite regress. So to participate is more than just to be similar to a cause; it's to have a property. A, a particular version of that of that causes universal property. So um, remember that every henad is, is a participated unity. And so what's added by the idea that things participate in henads and aren't just caused by henads is, well, this reference, this implicit reference to unity itself, to this universal thing. And the idea then that there are other things that also participate in unity itself. Um, so participation includes this idea of universality as well. That, that's not included in the idea of, of cause simply and effect. Um, it's is that so so because what you're saying is because the cause because participation will always be of this like intermediate thing like the second kind part of the participation story 
like the participated one and their yeah. cause sort of goes higher than that like you would say um like we say the one is not participated only henads are participated so the one isn't even what unifies things um it somehow causes the henads but with they they don't really practice whatever i don't know but so when you're... With, yeah the, the, the case of the, the the one is tricky but if you take news for instance news is not tricky to, uh, news is straightforward so yeah so the the participated news of of the moon so this is you know just the the eternal intelligence that determines the plan for the for the moon's orbits and and so on it's um, it's just a a particular form of intelligence, particular kind of intelligence, and the um, and uh, but um, intelligence itself, right? News itself um, is responsible for all the different kinds of intelligence and all that they produce, and it's universal. Whereas the particular the, the participated is particular this thing um, then there are further distinctions right for instance there's the distinction between the participated um, self-complete news so the one that exists on its own like the news of the moon and there's the the news that is just um, the wisdom that exists in a human being that doesn't exist separately from the human being Right. And so there's the imminent and the self-complete version of each of these participants. So also, um, so there's, um, yeah, there's the in intelligence and there's the property of intelligence. And these are both um, different kinds of participated entities. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, that's what the, it's this relation to a universal cause and um, the particular the particularization of this cause that is implied in uh, in the vocabulary of, of participation that but isn't true about every causal relation, especially because this is con constituted by causal relations, right? So. The unparticipated causes the participated things. Right. Um, that. Yeah, that's what I can. So something like, uh, Socrates is wise, has real wisdom, which is another way of, it's true to say Socrates is wise, which is the same thing as saying Socrates participates in participatable or whatever Socrates wisdom, but Socrates isn't wisdom, that would be dumb, uh, he has wisdom, so has is what we mean by, is the same thing as participation, he has wisdom, uh, or is wise, we could say that, but he isn't yeah. wise in the same way as wisdom is wise although he has that wisdom. Yeah. And doing the same thing for God, you would say something like, um, so you could say, so the that... sun is, is a God, but isn't really the universal God of being the sun. That was, that's weird. Um, so you can say that um, the the sun is a god means that there is the you know um, the sun is there is a divinity of the sun Helios there's a henad proper to it um, but it's not divinity itself right it's not what it is to be a god that's the unity itself. Right, so so the sun, so being the sun doesn't like exhaust uh, godliness. Like you wouldn't know what the, what it is to be a god from looking at the sun. Um, and what is it to be a god? Uh, 
it's it's to be a simple unity, which is also value exercising providence as exercising the bestowal of value on things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's to be a simple source of value. Hmm. Okay, and in, and in which way? So now is where I'm getting back stuck. So maybe we should read. And in which way is the sun something like that? In which way is sun something like that? Well, um, the sun is a shining body. The sun is a moving shining body. Um, the the sun is a moving shining body that moves by itself, has a soul. The sun is a moving shining body that has that moves by itself always according to some rational plan has a news. Um, the sun is a moving shining body that moves by itself according to some rational plan that bestows value on the world. That somehow is, I don't know, it's, so, this is a puzzle um, that somehow is, um, you know, a source of value for things. How can we understand this? Well, maybe in the sense that, first of all, there's also things that we see down here that are solar things and so that are tied to the sun, in the sense that they desire it and follow its paths and, um, and, and follow its rhythms. Um, there's, and so it could, could, it could mean this presence of the sun down here, um, not connected immediately to its actions, right? There's a, you know, there's a sunstone. Um, it could mean something astrological. Sun rules the sign of Leo. It's actually just entered Leo now. Um, and, it, and so there's a particular kind of character and ethos and value that's connected with Helios, with the sun. Um, that's um, uh, what we can, uh, that's one way of saying that it's a value, that's a simple source of value. Um, these, um, yeah, or maybe another way of cashing out the fact that there's a henna that is divine is saying that, okay, it's always acts rationally. But beyond acting rationally, it can also sometimes appear in unpredictable ways. For instance, in things like sunstones and things, um, it can uh, appear in things not connected to this rational plan. Um, so maybe that's just the first explanation that I gave. Um, yeah. Um, the or wait right or you can also say that you know this rational plan the year right what is the rational plan of the of the science the year um it's um it is a rational plan to achieve some unique goal. And uh, this unique goal is um, proper to the sun. There's no, no, none of the other rational plans seeks this same uh, goal. And that goal is, um, yeah, so maybe we can say the sun is a shining body that moves itself according to a rational plan that follows a unique goal. And this having a unique goal is what makes it uh, really divine. Um, how do we know it falls a unique goal? Like, how do we see it? How do we observe it? I don't know. Um, another, so in the, another, this is in the Timaeus. So in the Timaeus, in the story of the Timaeus, he first makes this, the body of the world, talks about making the elements. And then he makes this, um, the soul of the world, right? There's the construction of the soul of the world with the harmonies and all that. 
And then he creates time. And for Proclus, time is the noose of the world, right? So he makes time. What comes after that is plenitude, is making sure that there is all the kinds of living being on in every level of the world, right? It's um, not, make, not just making sure that there are all the kinds of different mortal living beings, all the kinds of animals that we see, but for Proclus, this means also that there's a bunch of invisible planets that we can't see so that there's lots of life and there's like a mini world at every celestial sphere. Um, and that's, and that would be like the final step, the 10th step, uh, because Proclus divides the Timaeus to giving 10 gifts um, to the world. And that would be where the Henads are introduced if he's gone from, um, body to soul to news that's henads that's missing. So maybe it's the plenitude of the world that indicates the presence of the henads. And so the what would make the sun particularly um, uh, divine, that we see it's divine, this goes back to the first explanation, but I mean, it's a fuller thing, would be the fact that it produces a plenitude. There's a procession from the sun. There is not just the sun itself. There are also people who are solar. There are animals who are solar. There are vegetables, minerals, and whatever. Um, it's this uh, principle of plenitude that then indicates that things are divine. Um, because, well, what does that have to do with being a value? It's hard to see how that has something to do with being a value, but it does have um, something to do with being akin to the first cause, right? So you have this infinite production. Um, so that's, yeah, okay. So that, that's my last attempt of giving an answer. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, would a specific human being be able to be defined by this criteria? Like if he, I don't know. So why As would an example to others, or if he becomes, if he has too many children, he does things that make no sense. I don't know things like that. <laughs> the problem with a specific human being is that they were born and they die, and since they do these things, it's they'll never be things that have a noose of their own. A noose always produces a perpetual thing. And so it was something with no beginning and no end. And so that already disqual disqualifies individual human beings. The whole human race, however, as I said, I was I puzzled about that and I wasn't sure. Um, the whole a whole uh, species, maybe. Um, but an individual thing that comes to be and passes away cannot be divine by these things. Okay, and uh, what about why human soul? <laughs> well, what well, what makes the soul human? What makes all soul human is that it gives um, the individual gives soul, life. but it doesn't die, does it? No, or maybe like, always it's going to have a different body tomorrow or whatever. So, if this. But again, what, what's the signature that the soul par participates in a noose, has a noose of its own, is that its, uh, its activities are always perfect. So it will always be giving life to the body. So the body it gives life to will never die. So um, uh, that, that doesn't work either. So you can't have an individual uh, um, because of this damn detail about birth and death, um, that's that this it's this mixture with non-being that just makes it impossible for the thing to be divine. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, which is, I mean, you're, um, 
Yeah, so like uh, just a side comment connected to this. Like, so why why isn't this Christian? Because there's this problem with death. Um, even if the guy resurrects, he was born. Um, and that's already a problem. And, um, and right. And if um, and if you say that, well, it's like a, it's like the soul always existed at one moment. It 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 it, it took a, it took a body and then it continued. Again, something that exists forever. We'll see a proposition about this. Something that exists forever and acts forever has to have a, a cyclical. Uh, behavior for Proclus. And so it can't just, in one moment of history, have this one body and then continue. It's going to have to have infinite bodies. Um, and um, anyway, the so there's this problem about why human beings can't work. But setting, aside, setting that aside, this is functionally identical to what Christians, to what some Christians will say about the incarnation, right? So uh, Thomas Aquinas says that the divine nature had the human nature um, as a soul controls a body, as an instrument. And that's also the relation that's supposed to take place between these participants, right? So the, um, uh, the, the Hanad uses the um, the news uses the soul, uses the body as a body. Um, it's this uh, similar um, relation. So, but but there's just issues of perfection and perpetuity that keep that rule individual human beings and also individual animals of any other kind, right? So it can't be you can't have a bull who that's a god, according to this theory. Um, and there are people who, I mean, I know uh, that Edward Butler one, um, has some things that he's said or written about the Apis bull. Apparently the, the Egyptian god Apis is identical with some specific living bull. And, um, I don't know how he, you know, explains it within the parameters of this theory, but at least as I read Proclus, that just that's just impossible. It, uh, um, the the ultimate participant of a god, uh, the body, cannot be something that came to be at one point in time. Okay, wait. This is just just because there's one more level. Is that what's happening? So like. Uh, you have humanity, for example, or Trinus, whatever, for example, which is a god. Uh, and you can't have a specific chi being a god just because there's you need one more cycle of the whole participation story to get from Trinus to a tree, and that's what's like, like that's where you stop being a god. No, I mean, or, you. Um, um, what? I, I don't get what the. Something. The question is. Uh, so maybe I'm confused. So once we have this like um, participation thing, well, like we say, um, okay, so participation isn't. Uh, um, okay. Everything is caused by the gods. Um, that doesn't make everything into gods. That makes gods into everything, maybe. That doesn't, in some like virtual way or something. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make everything into gods. Um, the gods cause everything through this whole system, um, which makes some of the system into gods. Does that make sense? Right, the, the 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 structural features for as long system. as it's a system, and when the moment the system starts producing things, that's like really weird. Um, I don't know, like mm, the song, well, that's not exactly a good idea, but like if you would have 
like to take a creation story literally you would have something like that only starts after all the gods finish um so not what he thinks that Emmaus is about because that's not literally a creation story but something um, like does that make sense like um right i i, I like I someone who is like a, a kabbalist who reads like uh Breshis as being like well it's also about the creation of things that are not really created but also about like there's double triple ten whatever ten, as many times as needed story and then he would say well the literal sense of creation is only true for say individual like yeah individual human beings or individual trees um like it would be incorrect to say god created treeness because treeness is a is sort of a god there's a procession there and there's like this whole system mm -hmm. happening but there isn't uh like that's the only time where it stops being God creating gods or whatever. <laughs> right, I, I, I see. And, I see what you're and becomes something that's not a god. Yeah, and um, it's not a god only because, like, it's sort of like one. It, it's like a shame. Like he missed it by one step. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, <laughs> like your father uh, was you a can... god, but then. It's a shame, like it's done <laughs> precisely by you. Like, why couldn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's tough because you're a different kind of thing. Okay, but so yeah, so um, right, and it has to reach this level for Proclus. I mean, Proclus has these arguments where he says, "So why is there evil, right? Or why are there things that are destroyed? Why are there things that are destructible?" And then he says, well, you know, if we stopped with the eternal things, then the eternal things would be the worst things. And that would be bad, right? Um, and so there's this idea that the, the first principle, which is unity, which is goodness, it, it requires the existence of all the different ranks of goodness. And even, and that means you have to get all the way to the things that aren't always good, to the things that are evil or the things that, you know, become, that, that become imperfect and then are corrupt and, just, and, and, and destroyed. Um, so that's the, um, uh, and, and you can say, yeah, there's, oh, shame it's just this one level but this one level has to exist also because you know since you know the uh proposition 25 everything that's perfect creates you can't stop just with perfect things because then the last perfect thing won't create and then it won't be perfect the or all the perfect things have to create and so there has to be some level after perfection um and so there has to be this level of of things that are really born and really destroyed um this level however even this level can't you know be can't exist on it entirely on its own because in order for it to exist it has to um perpetuate itself through these cycles of generation and corruption and then the site and then the site the cyclical thing as a whole the species the element this um this is uh, something perfect and divine um so in a sense the you're asking like when when is the, in a sense for Proclus you never get the proper creation story um, it's the, the proper creation story is like this detail at the end of the theogony, right? Um, if you, if we're distinguishing between the, the proper creation story, which is the creation of real independent things that are not God, 
and from the allegorical creation story, which is actually just the unfolding of divine potencies or something like that, the, the, um, the generations of the gods. The, um, the last step of this theogony will include the creation of, um, will like imply the creation of these destructible things. But, but it's like that, it, it only happens, creation only happens by implication. Uh, never by a an effort to produce these these destructible things. Um, or, yeah, I want to say something like story. There's all the reasons there are individual human beings because it's just the birth and death of each of, of the individual, of the individual, and not just human beings, but other corruptible things. Um, because, yeah, I think that's, that's the view. The, the finite is somehow contained within the infinite. And it's never an, a specific object of production by the infinite. Yeah, I don't know. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I think I'm uh, at the end of where I can get to for now. So. <laughs> um... Okay, let's, let's read the text of 129 then. Yeah, okay. Uh, 129, oh yeah, so let's read it. Four. The whole order of gods is above the intelligence, position 115. And if all participation is accomplished through kinship and likeness, 32, the primary participant of the supra-existential Hanat will be undivided being because they're the most like, um, the most like these things, these Hanats. The next, that being which touches process. I don't know what process is, nothing. And third, the world of process. And each will participate through the order immediately super adjacent to it. So we're going in order. Yeah. Um, process means things that change, the, the world of generation. Um, he used this in Proposition 50, where he said that everything measured by time is a process. And here he's talking in a very general way. So undivided being would be news. Right, because um, because it's uh, entirely eternal, you know, all entirely in the present. That being which touches process, so that would be what's both a being and a process, which is soul, and then the world of process bodies. Um, where this parallels in the immutable, the self-changing, and the change by others from Proposition Fourteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The divine character penetrates even to the last term of the participant series, but always through the mediation of terms akin to itself. Thus, the Hanad bestows first on an intelligence that power among the divine attributes, which is peculiarly its own, and causes this intelligence to be in the intellectual order what itself is in the order of unities, meaning it makes it self uh cause or something like that um yeah um so uh, so we talked about how there was this particular property this peculiar property to each god and that things have uh the and things in other orders have an analogous uh property so um, I think, yeah, so 
Selene, the god of the moon, it first bestows on a noose. That particular Selene quality onto um, onto the noose and makes that noose the Selene of nooses. Mm -hmm. okay. Does the hand, uh, yeah, and because of this intelligence, okay. And if this intelligence, so, and then that noose would be called the god or something like that. Yeah, that um, would be yeah. The if the intelligence be participable, though it is the henna uh, through sorry, through it the henna is present also to a soul and is cooperative in linking the soul to intelligence and inflaming it, whatever that means. Making it alive, I guess. Um, um well inflaming it is rather poetic but it's probably um Prophes uses this kind of metaphor when he's talking about when the one of the soul is united to the um, uh, um to the henna and so it's like inflaming it as in causing it to a moment sorry um causing it to uh well, to speak loosely, to be in some kind of ecstasy, but you know, it's in a. It's, if it's participating in news, it's constantly contemplating the forms, <laughs> and if it's participating further in a henna, it's somehow in communion with this god and is, as it were, the marker in the hand of the god. I think that's what's behind the side, mm -hmm. behind inflaming. Um. Okay. Through this soul again, oh. if it be also through the soul, if it participated by a body, the hand communicates even to the body an echo of its own quality. In this way, the body becomes not only animate and intellective, but also divine. And the sense that has received from a soul life and movement, from intelligence indissoluble, indissoluble, I don't know how you say, like unchangeable permanence, and from the hand which it participates a divine unification. Each successive principle communicated to the cons consequent term something of its own substance. 18, it says. Yeah. 18 is that each uh, thing, uh, everything that produces just by its being may is primary what the secondary is, what, what the effect is secondarily. Um, yeah, connected with this, uh, just something else I thought to say about inflaming is that the why why use the metaphor of flame here? Well, because fire goes up, right? So if if it's inflames, the soul's elevating the soul to a stand to a situation above the soul. Right? Besides the fact that the flaw fire is connected with illumination, and um, the. And, and again, yeah, the, the question that you asked before is, okay, what makes the son of God? That's what we were, uh, that's the question of like, how do you interpret this divine unification? Like what, what does the body actually receive? It's, um, it's not clear. It can't just be that the body is united as an organic body that it gets from, um, from the soul and that it's united as a, perfect always existing unit um, organic body that it gets from news so what is this extra unity that it gets and that's what we were talking about and mm -hmm. it's unclear so um the last idea that i had that is that um it's connected to plenitude then we would read this unification as active right it the body somehow unifies a whole world of things and so it's because there's this whole world of solar things that we recognize um, the sun as a god. Um, and that's, uh, uh, yeah. So are there... Okay, uh, so being that the sun uh, isn't an eternal body, it's not really a god. Right, we would say exactly. Um, today, a prop client would have to say, actually, it's not a god. Actually, it's not a god. Um, there, there are just uh, huge problems connecting Proc, uh, Proclus's 
uh, philosophy to, well, what we know today, because the perpetuity of the world is super, super central to them, and the perpetuity of all its structural features. And it's unclear how to get around this. Um, one possibility is trying to make a move. One possibility that, you know, that I would like to investigate is moving it to, um, to nature. So to say things, you know, that uh, what's important isn't that things are perpetual, but that they're produced by nature, understood as, I don't know, this uh, power that produces all of your inorganic, um, all the non-human things. You know, like uh, this is like the, this romantic idea that like Shelley and other people have it. It's this force that, uh, um, it's dynamic power that produces all the different uh, stars and elements and the, uh, everything until you get to the human being. Um, that might be, this romantic idea of nature might be a way of th that we can include development and evolution and time into Proclus um, or somehow make it compatible. Another thing is to say, well, maybe Proclus's philosophy is just true about the world as we experience it and about the world of human experience. And so things don't have to be really in themselves perpetual. It's just, um, you know, they're, they're perpetual for our life, um, our life world. Um, that it still has problems because we have experienced extinction, right? And so that's a problem. So there's, you know, ex extinction has happened for hundreds of species within human history. And so that wouldn't solve everything, but it would solve, for instance, the sun. Um, and, but yeah, in general, there's this whole problem about, for Proclus, if coming to the conclusion that the world is not eternal, is banishing noose and soul and the gods from the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's a that's a problem, and I don't know any good real treatments of it. Okay. Um. So we did. Uh, well, we did everything that I planned. But uh, we can uh, do, well, we can start at 1.30 then. Yeah, okay, just one thing. So what I want to go. I'm just still need, I'm going to ask you one second. Um, um, yeah, well, no, just about the previous thing. What's if could we do the like laws of nature or something like that? Or that has to be like a thing for that? Like uh, maybe the speed of light is eternal or something like that? Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a way of doing around that. Um, since, yeah, light behaves in weird ways given relativity. And yeah, I sometimes see this claim, you know, light actually doesn't move. And um, uh, although I don't, I don't know how physically strict that is. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe that could be a way. Yeah. Um, it's, it's unclear. Yeah. Certainly the laws of nature, the idea of laws of nature corresponds to part of what Proclus wants to say when he says that, that you know, the, the cosmos is governed by noose. Um, there are these eternal laws. Noose is more than just a set of laws, but it's certainly part of it, right? How do we know that the planets have a noose because they follow these eternal laws? Mm -hmm. um, and it's um, it's unclear. Uh, like even so. Giordano Bruno is someone who 
is still very much a Platonist and says things that are very like Proclus, but he abandons helio uh, geocentrism, right? And he has an infinite universe and things. And so he's like a model for how to adapt these ideas, but he still has infinite time. So it doesn't uh, re respond exactly to this. Um, and maybe, maybe you can uh, salvage it by saying, okay, there are these many, uh, maybe the multiverse is a way out. Hmm. Saying, okay, well, this universe is finite and things, but they're actually um, infinitely many universes and that this meta universe, it's eternal, it's perpetual. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, uh, yeah, it's the eternal structures of this that are, you know, truly divine. Um, I don't know. Yeah, um, it's if you say that the whole, of course, there are contemporary cosmologies that don't think that, you know, that it's just uh, a big bang and the world will end, but that this is a cyclical process. And so after the big crunch, there'll be another big bang and so on. So it's kind of like a stoic universe. Um, and that would still be for Proclus would argue, well, then you still need a bigger frame of reference outside of this. Because what assures you that there will always be a big bang followed by a big crunch? You need something perpetually acting to make sure. Because if it's really the whole world that's destroyed, then even the things that would guarantee that there's another big bang are destroyed. Um, so you need something perpetual. So there's going to be a need bigger frame of reference. But that would mean that what we thought was the sublunar world is actually the whole universe. And there's a whole heaven out there that's um, regulating this uh, universe. Um, that would be because Proclus believes that on the earth, there are periodical floods and fires that um, they don't destroy everything, but um, they do destroy a lot. So. This kind of cyclicality is something that's proper to the um, the sublunar world. So yeah, may maybe a Prokline view would be just to say, well, the whole you know this everything, this whole universe that's studied by physics today, that's the whole sublunar sphere, and beyond it, there's still a whole. And what physics has taught us that there's still a whole other heaven out there, hmm. right? It's a it's like the Phaedrus. It's like the uh, um, literal, literally, we could get to the, the end and stand on outside and we'd see the infinite plane of truth. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, uh, okay, so there. wait, Robin, I have one more thing. So you said God means many, like the the. That's what I wanted to know. Like the the. It seems after what we do one twenty eight that God means really one thing, is just that, something sort of become God, uh, by being participated in the, in a God directly enough. Like the sun body is really less of a God than the sun soul. I mean, it's one step. Uh, further away from the reason it's God or something like that. Yeah. That's really why I get to this whole like weird thing where like, well, now you're just one step further than that. And that's a shame. Um, meaning it's not the same. It's not a God. Like, well, it's like I, it's like I wave, like I wave a, um, uh, uh, a letter about and say, you see, you see this, um, I don't know. This is what the king says. This is what the right. But the paper is not the king, right? The right. Is not right, God. right. Right. And and no, it's like I wonder, like things like hmm, who I don't know. The czar, Yudha Libis has a whole book about the sun and the czar. But the czar has this whole thing where like the people who worship the sun were not crazy. Uh, they just uh, mistake they confuse the angel of the sun with the god or something like that um and then seems to become like a semantic question like okay so in other words the sun has a a um 
let's say a soul or for just the next step beyond the body. And the Zohar would even like, I even know the name of it. It's called this and this, whatever. And well, others have a different name for it, but that's a different last week question. And, but, but that thing is just, is just a, like even the soul of the sun isn't a God. It doesn't have any real, um, I don't know, you would say like real power or real self-starting thing or self-unity or whatever. And therefore, if you worship it, you're confused. Um, yeah, I think for our or it's just, also, yeah. Oh, he does what, worship the sun like you or worship. Yeah, so you can see this as like, this is, you can think of this as also an answer to certain people, like um, if people say, oh, you you pagans, you worship the, you worship these bodies, bodies are gross, and it says, no, 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 we actually worship the henad, you know, and it's absolutely simple, it's just that the henad is put on lots of clothes, and the last clothing is the body. Um, and that's, uh, right. And that's a, you know, a point that's, uh, often made, um, it's often made since Hegel, like Hegel made it, I don't know if Hegel's drawing on someone else, but, you know, Hegel says, it's absurd to think that the, you know, that these early religions that we learn about actually worship these physical bodies that we study now today. The mood was something completely different for them. And, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't just this physical thing, and and that's uh, Proclus is kind of saying this too. But it was also the physical thing. It was also the physical thing, but like like a human being is also his body, right? So, for example, if someone gets like a relic of a dead human being, and like, uh something right. like that that would become uh stupid by this way of thinking yeah and that's like Unless... kind of like the kind of like kind of, uh, it's like a pagan point against christians it's like these people ignore these powerful living beings in the heavens that keep uh, that our whole lives depend on but they go to the cemetery and they worship toenails That being said, um, you can um, you could say that the toenail or the relic of a human being is something like um, is something that has the individuality of that human being. Right? It was mm -hmm. it was the toenail of this person. It's unique to that person, and then that and that puts me in touch with them. And then that's actually something like using a synthemata, using a symbol in the sense that we used last time. Right, using a rooster um, in in your worship of the sun, right? And they said, okay, well that 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 makes sense from this perspective. But you can't say that that relic is immediately divine. It's not divine in the same way, right? It's not being animated by um, by the god, especially because it's dead. Yeah, but oh, you might, but okay, whatever. There's another thing. And and is it um so is it true is 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 it historically true that the people who say God for everything are like just more liberal like the I don't know whoever um uh, Homer who talks about all these divine things and everything is divine and we don't even know when he means a god or a person or a hero or a demon or a diamond or whatever. Is it just that they're, uh, like, would he, what do you think that, would they recognize this, like, lot of meanings of the word God? Or is Yeah, just... he read, so, so yeah, he, he would recognize a lot, lots of meanings of the word God in reading Homer. And he thinks that a philosopher can read Homer without a problem. That he can actually draw lots of philosophical insight from Homer reading him properly. But, 
because Homer and other poets is really liberal about the way they use God and really liberal about the way they depict the gods, it's bad for most people, right? Um, it's it's dangerous. Oh, just trying to say, is that, like would Homer recognize this, himself as using the word God liberally, or would he say, well, I don't know, these are all gods? I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's hard to know what Homer was Not as dark. I don't know. But, but um, the, um, you know, at the end of the Odyssey, um, so Odysseus, he returns home and he kills all the, all the people, all the suitors that wanted to marry his wife. And then he gets there and the wife wants to test to see if it's really him. And so she she says uh, she says, you know, that her that she moved her bed and or or that she will have the bed moved so that he can sleep in it. The stranger, she's addressing the stranger. And then this provokes a, you know, a furious reaction from where he says, this is impossible because I built, you know, this bed is made out of a tree growing from the ground. And I built the room around it. You can't move this bed. And through that, he shows that he actually is, he knows about the truth of the bed and he, and he is his her husband. And, and then he can like, and then they can go and sleep together. Um, but, and so, why do I mention this? It's because so there's there is this uh, and uh, idea in Homer about using an image to provoke true knowledge, and 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 then this true knowledge gives you access to um, uh, to some uh, uh, to to something further, and of course you could take this as an image for the very you know. Uh, the act of interpreting Homer. And uh, so, you know, Homer in the in his own poems knows that images can be interpreted in more than one way. So I don't see why he wouldn't think that you could, uh, uh, why he wouldn't admit that he uses the word God in many ways, right? So in some way, Prophet thinks the proper way to, to, uh, to read Homer is like, you read Homer and then you say, this is absurd. The gods can't do anything evil and they're eternal and la 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 la. And then, and then that gives you access to the real context, to the real unity with the gods that the poem can give you. But if you don't have this uh, reaction, that shows that you're actually, you know, not the real deal. You're not the true, um, um, you're not the listener that this is intended for. And the, um, the poem will be actually a kind of barrier between you and the gods and it's not something that will connect you to them and all the people sorry all the people that think uh this is nonsense or whatever idolatry uh are the people who just um have a stricter view of the word god or who don't know about any of this or like even Sac I mean yeah but okay Socrates wants to delete Homer but um sure I mean it's or we would say oh that's people. for that yeah there are we do are real people that really said that this is bad right right there are real people that really said this is bad um Proclus mentions pagans in his day who say it's because of the myths that um um, that Christians are getting so many converts and we should really abandon the myths. And Prophet is kind of re replying to these people with these notions of symbol and, and image and so on. Um, so, so there were people, but uh, for Prophet, these people are only half right. They, you know, they have this stricter image of, uh, of God and that's good. They can, they serve this purifying uh they have this purifying role in our thought and in education and aristotle is a prime person like this you know he thinks that there are gods 
but the myths, they just exist so that people will obey um, the laws and things. Um, but so they, they serve this purifying role, but ultimately there's a deeper truth that they're missing because of their strictness. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, that's the, the view of the Prophets. And uh, connected to this, so the gods, I mean, Daimonists are often connected with this purifying role. And so because of that, Proclus will, or at least as I understand it, Proclus will often refer to um, Aristotle as the Daimonios Aristotle, like the, the daimon-like Aristotle, as opposed to Plato, who he always calls the divine Plato. Right, but we don't know what divine means now. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but in the in, in the in the connection between divine and 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 daimonic, the idea is like the daimonic is a path to the divine, and specifically it provides us a path to it by purifying us. Um, yeah. Um, is that um? Yeah, I forgot what I want. Oh, yeah. But again, we have the the question of the of the yeah. There's like the opposite people that are not happy. I don't know if there's really such people. I mean, there are such people, but maybe like only five of them. That are not happy with uh, there being anything that's not God. Not sure why that happens and and how. Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah. And that's a different kind of. I don't know what how that. Uh, that's what I was all time thinking of, and I don't know how that connects here. Like if there's only i think something like if you don't have all these forms in between maybe forms and 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 everything else um and then you end up with saying with having like um the being of everything is god and then that doesn't ever stop or something like that or just directly the god yeah, so I think the closest that you get to this in antiquity would be something like Heraclitus or the Stoics. Stoics are drawing a lot on Her uh, Heraclitus. Um, so the Stoics think that Zeus, you know, is a body that's, that goes through everything and they don't get to the point of saying that, you know, nothing is not God, but they do think, for instance, they are absolute determinists and, um, and they think that everything will always happen exactly the way it happened um, over and over, like infinitely many times. But even in this system, you know, there's besides Zeus, the active principle, there's matter, the passive principle. So, even they wouldn't say that, you know, but, you know, there's no part of the passive principle that doesn't have the active principle mixed in with it. Um, yeah, or maybe, you know, but Parmenides and, uh, and Her Heraclitus, you know, Parmenides thinks that there's just being. And... Right, and, but all, all of these things, all of these things, so... Hmm. Heraclitus thinks that the whole world is a fire that's always burning. Um, but yeah, I don't, so what Proclus does when he, when he faces these claims of real strong monism is that he usually like, for instance, for Parmenides, he reinterprets it to say, oh, he's talking about primary being. He's talking about something up there in the world of forms, in the intelligible world. Uh, exactly. 
he is not actually denying uh, the existence of, of other things. Um, it's just that this guy who was such a mystic, he was so absorbed in the contemplation of being that he didn't talk, you know. He didn't realize uh, there were other things. But yeah. does this, doesn't this all have to do with like taking the forms of things or the structures of things more seriously than the things themselves? Or like, it's just assuming everything exists already before we start to think about them. Like this whole, all of these distinctions are about like what kind of structure it is. So this amount of unification or whatever is God and this amount is not. Yeah. Yeah. But you could like ignore all of these things and say, yeah, like there's only being and non being. <laughs> like if you're Aristotle and you like just, you really don't believe, you, like you really take for granted the, the existence of the universe. And like, I just need to explain change or I just need to explain structure or something like that. Oh. Well, no, I don't think that's what's going on. In part because Proclus does think you have to also account for the existence of things. You can't just explain change or structure. And, and Aristotle, it's not even that he takes for granted. Aristotle has an argument for why you can't explain existence. Right? Um, existence in that sense is just a single predicate. And if you, it's like just a one place thing. If you want to explain anything, there have to be two places. So you can only really explain the existence of changing things where it's one thing has the form. So there are two things. But because um, otherwise you can't build a solution. There has to be a middle term. If there's a middle term, you have to have a two place thing. Um, so he has an argument for why you you can't explain like existence simply. You can only explain change uh, change. And um now i don't think that's what Proclus is doing Proclus actually thinks Aristotle's wrong about that you can explain what a single place existence um i don't know I, I don't know what the theory of proof and syllogism behind that is but that he's certainly committed to something like that um he it's also not just the case of quantity. It's not just more and more uh, structure, more and more complexity. For Proclus, self-motion, what soul introduces to the world, is irreducible to noos, right? That's part of what self-constitution means. So these levels are irreducible to each other. Um, and Right, and then since they're irreducible, it's not the structure that he takes. So maybe there is something similar here, you're right. There is something similar in the sense that he says that the different levels of being are irreducible. They have these monads as their causes and the monads have to be led back to the henads. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's structure. Um, And I wouldn't say that it's just taken for granted. The same way that Aristotle has an argument that you can't explain one place being, Proclus has arguments for why you can't explain, for instance, change, um, like explain change entirely in, cha in terms of unchanging things, or you can't explain um, knowledge entirely in terms of just existence. And uh, you can't explain space, you know, extension, separation entirely in terms of, uh, of unity, right? um, of life. So he has these arguments for why these things are irreducible. Um, and there are dependence relations, but there's also an irreducibility. 
And then that's what ultimately they then leads to the to the polytheism. So there, yeah, that's there's something similar to Aristotle going on. Yeah. Okay, so let me pick this up next time. Okay. Uh, yeah.